Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. My guest on the podcast today is Russ Timpson, Managing Director at Crisis Boardroom and the Tor Building Fire Safety Network. Now, the world's leading thinkers on high-rise fire safety are coming to FDIC International in 2024. This is the eighth international tall building high-rise conference, and it will make its U.S. debut April 15th to the 18th, 2024, alongside FDIC International in Indianapolis, Indiana. Now, the event is recognized by the IFE, Institute of Fire Engineers, and will bring delegates together with speakers from around the world for three days to provide valuable insights into current best practices, tall building fire safety innovation, and relevant fire safety issues including facade testing, second stair debate, smoke hoods, green walls, electric vehicles, PV panels, tall timber, means of escape for vulnerable people, smoke control, high-rise firefighting, drones, hoarding residents, balcony fire risks, new generation fire detection, case studies, car parks, high-rise construction, lithium-ion batteries, arson prevention, fire engineering developments, and a whole host more as if that list wasn't already enough. This is, honestly folks, a massive, massive event. FDIC is something that has been on my list for like two years now, in fact, probably longer than two years to be fair. Almost every guest talks about it. 40,000 firefighters getting together in Indianapolis. It's an incredible event. I desperately want to go. But what our aim is today is we're going to have a good long chat with Russ and pull out some really incredible insights, give you some look into the stuff that's going to be available at the conference, the speakers, the case studies that we're going to go into. And also I encourage you to go into the notes and go and have a look at tallbuildingfiresafety.com where again, you can find a whole host of presentations, case studies, just some really useful information to add to the takeaways from today's conversation. This year at the event, each day is also going to feature a topical and relevant debate. So day one, they've got Have Lessons Been Learned from Grenfell Tower and the Bronx Fire. The Bronx Fire, we're going to put a link in the notes for that as well because a lot of the UK audience might not be aware of that. Really, really interesting incident. Really tragic incident, but uh, again, lessons to be learned from all of these. Day two, we've got, are we ready for green walls, wall, timber, in high-rise? Interesting debate. And day three, I think it's uh, it's going to form quite a strange one because it's how are we changing occupant behavior and characteristics affecting fire safety in high-rise residential buildings? This is a conversation that we've actually had with another guest around how we do the instruction on this, how we get compliance, how we get people to buy in, and how we engage with people that are living as occupants in these buildings. So there's loads for us to get to today. You might want to listen to this one twice. And again, be sure to go and have a look in the links. You can find the link to toolbuildingfiresafety.com. There will be an email address there for Russ as well and a link to his LinkedIn. So lots to take away from today. Let's get in there with today's guest, Russ Timpson. I'll see you on the other side. So this year will be the eighth International Tall Building High Rise Fire Safety Conference. Now for some of our listeners, perhaps a large chunk of it, they will be elbow deep in some of the learnings and very, very interested in learning what is happening at the tip of the sword of tall buildings and high rise safety around the world. But people may never have heard of this conference before. So when was the first one that you started and kind of why did you put it together? Okay, so... When I left the fire service, I started a fire engineering business, and one of the fire engineers that I recruited uh, had recently done a, a master's in, in fire engineering and was very interested in tall buildings. So uh, we wanted to get into that marketplace as a very small, newly started business, and of course, you're going up against some of the, the bigger consultancies out there, so it's very difficult. So we thought that perhaps we could pick up some some post occupancy fire engineering work, refurbs, that kind of stuff, or rewrites of fire strategies. So we we try to think of a novel way that we could get to um, talk to people who run, operate, insure, manage tall buildings, and we looked around for a uh, if you like an industry group, and we couldn't find one. So I said, well, look, let's start one. So I, I had a small network. And effectively, we met in a pub and we sort of sat around and held hands in a group therapy about how difficult this thing was. And then we did that for about a year, uh, had about four meetings. And then somebody said, why don't we get a speaker in and uh, a couple of trays of sandwiches and, um, and and turn it into a bit of an afternoon. And, and that's really the genesis of it. And then 
we did that for two or three years and then <clears throat> uh, and, and every time we did it we added a bit more and a bit more and a bit more so uh, it started very humbly uh, and then we got to the, the situation where we were having like 150 people coming to these events and um, wow. uh, and we were flying people in from other countries um, so it became mm. um, if I dare I say it sort of fairly amateurish to start with to the point where we had to get really organized and so we got to the point where as I say we were flying people in from abroad and we'd hired venues and and we were producing brochures and stuff like that. So we, we'd really sort of grown up. And um, at that point, we thought, right, actually, we, we've got to try and give this some credibility. So that's why we called it rather grandly the, you know, the International Tour Building Fire Safety Conference. And um, you've got to have a little bit of audacity about yourself, though, haven't you? Like, it's that difference between well, recognizing your worth and being brave and bold enough to go for it because I, I say the same with the podcast i'm like there's so many people who will be far better at this than me but some people don't have the gumption the assertiveness the willingness to put your head above the parapet and look stupid um which i regularly do uh because you know if you don't do that you're never going to share these learnings like i'm sure you will have had it at many of the tall buildings conferences where you'll have you know forgotten the speaker's name or you'll have made a blunder or you've misspoken and got something wrong but the, you have to create that safe environment for people to learn because everyone's coming there from a different perspective a different background a different experience i mean you actually started your career as a submariner didn't you You were royal navy before you went into the fire service i did i joined the royal navy when i was 16 and um it was in the submarine service um uh, and then i left and um I, well, I got married and didn't want to be, you know, away with being married. So then I yeah. joined Kent, Kent Fire Brigade, obviously the greatest fire service in the UK. <laughs> the great. um, Who do I regularly work with? From There's a couple of people I work with from Kent. Oh, that go around the country doing assessing with. I'll remember their names in a minute. But uh, it is a it is it's a, a, it's a long time ago. It, it, I mean, I was in the fire service when we used to look like Fireman Sam. Um, so... You know, I left in uh, 96, so it's a long time ago. Um, but I had uh, six and a half years on the red lorries and I loved every minute of it. So when you first started putting this together and it grew arms and legs, what were some of the common themes that were coming through back then? Because people will look at things now. We've had a number of really, really large incidents. And this uh, and your, your, you know, your conference itself has really grown arms and legs and become this beast where people go to get the tip of the sword information. But you guys and girls were doing this long before we saw some of the big incidents that we've perhaps seen in the last uh, 10 or so years. What were yes. the um, original conversations and stuff that were happening at maybe some of the first couple of events? Because we're in the eighth iteration of it now. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> we, we started the Tall Buildings Fire Safety Network in 2009. As I said, we had some fairly informal events um, and really, when I was pulling the agenda together, um, I, I used to do the uh, CPD program for the Southeast Branch of the Institution of Fire Engineers. And mm. if you, one of the perks of doing that, and I'd advise anybody to get involved because it's a great thing to do, was I picked all the subject matter that I thought my CPD was weakest at. So I got to pick all the subjects. Are you with me? So I, I as well as... <laughs> The thing about organising is, it, yeah, it's a pain and it's hard work. But then again, you get to you get to pick the the areas and the speakers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the same thing applied really for when we started doing the conferences. It was really the stuff that I was not sure about. I was I, I wanted clarification, uh, and so we approached the speakers. Mm. And um, what became clear to me back in two thousand and ten, two thousand and eleven, is we we certainly had an issue with 
facades and cladding. Um, mm-hmm. And then we had the fire in Azerbaijan, uh, the Baku fire, uh, which if your mm-hmm. listeners are not familiar with it, I YouTube it and go and have a look at it. And um, mm. it is, um, for all the world, Petrifying. it just looks like Grenfell. And yeah. so I wanted to understand why that fire had been so devastating and, and, and became clear to me that the cladding systems that were being used a number of them were not fit for purpose. And uh, so we started trying to jump up and down about this. Um, in fact, I attended, I was invited to speak at the aluminium industry. Um, why they picked me, God knows, because they knew I was going to come and say something fairly controversial about ACP panels. Um, and I showed the Azerbaijan video and I said, this is coming to a city near you soon. Um, wow. I said, this stuff is... Is, uh, has, has got huge potential for harm. And I royally got told to wind my neck in by uh, a number of people saying that there wasn't the evidence base for what I was saying um, wow. and that okay. I was scaremongering and um, you know, you, you're going to make lots of people unsettled in their homes, etc., etc., etc. So that was around about 2012, 2013. And, uh, but, but we did... During the conferences, I tried really, really hard to get this as a subject matter and get it out there for, for conversation. But of course, you know, in risk management, the, the phenomenon of the unrocked boat, you know, you, you know you're sitting there on that mm. tranquil uh, water, nothing's happened, so there's no problem. Um, and, you know, I'm a fire engineer and growing up as I did, having to learn you know, the early iterations, the old double five, double eight series of British standards and, and then, you know, the approved document B. Um, it was absolutely clear to me that there were significant shortcomings in approved document B, um, you know, the limited combustibility question. And <clears throat> when we were having speakers and we were talking about this, um, I think it's it's fairly you know if, if you if you read uh, Peter Apsey's book Show Me the Bodies type thing, we had him on the podcast. Yeah, Peter. That, is, that, oh, it's so well written. That kind of approach was was absolutely prevalent. Which is, you know, fire deaths are going down. Look at the fast fire statistics. Mm-hmm. We've got this sussed. Um, uh, you know, don't don't make an unnecessary fuss because you're only going to make people scared and unhappy and uh, and um, and so that was. Do you think it's because he exists outside of the standard uh, sector, with great respect to him, that he was able, allowed, I don't know how to word for it, but like, he's really fantastic. And he doesn't slate the Fire and Rescue Service, to be fair, because that was one of the things, I know we're not going to go into too much depth about Grenfell, but the fact that the first aspect of the inquiry was predominantly focused around the emergency services response, and that kind of became... Uh, a bit of a theme for a lot of it, unfortunately. But he did a wonderful... His lens really starts at the other end, where he speaks about that just entrenched, endemic, like long-term uh, rotting from the inside out of policies, procedures, legislation, and bending of the rules, false testing reports, and it's it's a fantastic. We'll, we'll put a link into it for again for people because I actually listened to it on audiobook and loved it. Really, really great. Yeah, the, I mean the culture at the time is one that I that I borrowed from the uh, aviation industry, and that's a phenomenon known as willful blindness. Yes, um, where you know if you're competent or you know approaching competent, you know there's a problem. You know there's a shortcoming. You know there's a misunderstanding. You know that there's a misinterpretation of some of the guidance. But because there's no, there hasn't been a big incident, then you all buy into this collective uh, amnesia. Um, And in the aviation industry, it's called willful blindness. And I think the whole industry was aware of that. You know, we we knew, for example, that nobody was handing over documentation at the end of a construction project. You know, the 16B transference of information simply was not just was not happening. Um, hmm. We knew about the, the limited combustibility. We knew about some of the shortcomings of high-rise firefighting operations. You know, I, I, hmm. I spent a lot of time talking to colleagues from around the world and I was stunned at the amount of training that was going into wind-driven fires. And then when I was speaking to the UK fire services and going to conferences, etc., um, this was something that wasn't even 
wasn't even on you know wasn't even on their radar uh, as far still as still very much in our infancy, weren't we? Um, and, and 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 adhering to some you know procedures, the the dogmatic sort of adherence to stay put, defend in place, which in it, you know in my opinion had some clearly some some significant uh, issues with it, um, and of course mm. it needed tragically and, and 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 why we have to do it, it needed a, a massive tragedy to. To shake us out of that. Um, Do you think we have been shaken out of it? I think that what we have to accept is that um, multi-fatality fires in high-rise buildings are very low probability events, but they're very high consequence events. So normally when we're doing a risk assessment, we use a, a, um, a symmetrical grid, a 5x5, five five, a 6x6, six six, you know, hazard against, so consequence against probability. These types of fires don't fit that model because they are very low probability. They don't happen very often, but when they do happen, we're going to kill a lot of people. And so if you again set that against the background of national fire statistics where, you know, you ask people and they say, well, but the people aren't dying in high-rise fires. They were, though. You know, <laughs> I mean, they weren't dying in the same numbers. But again, to go back to Peter's book... Um, you know, the wonderful intro to it where he gives the example of Lacknell House is such a worryingly, worryingly obvious connection. You know, I think my daughter could connect, uh, Stevie Wonder could connect the dots between some of these things. Um, and my concern is a little bit like the old mortgage crisis. I worry that we've given it lip service, made lots of noise about it. I think the fire service, and of course I would say this because I'm biased, um, fire service has taken a lot of learnings from it. We weren't perfect. We weren't certainly um, the majority at fault. Uh, could we have done things different tactically and strategically? Most definitely. Because we are kind of easier, and please correct me if you disagree, we're easier to hold account and there's more of an appetite to bring the axe down on um, on us. We've, we've done a big knee jerk in terms of awareness, training, upskilling, rewriting of policies, procedures. But it doesn't feel, and again, I sit in uh, at a great distance from anything that would happen from a um, buildings and legislative capacity, but it doesn't feel like the same lessons learned. I feel like that's a bigger Titanic to turn. I feel it moves at a glacial pace. Um, and there's so many quote-unquote crises in the UK government that it's very quickly swept under the rug. I think that the, the, and I've said this before, is, you know, the people, the people advising government are eminent people um, and they've been in those positions for quite some time. And I think it's time for some different voices. I think there's some time for some different opinions um, who come at this from a different perspective. Um, um, and I think, you know, there's lots of... Um, ways that we could perhaps look at this with a fresh pair of eyes because um, it is a very small group of people that are advising government at a high level. I mean, I've been doing it for so long, I feel like they're a little bit stuck in an echo chamber. Well, you know, certainly, you know, if you think about Lackanall House and um, the opportunities that Lackanall House presented and we weren't able to exploit the learnings to the extent that I wish we had have done, um, mm -hmm. I think it's probably true to say that um, we we could perhaps be looking at this from a different perspective because certainly we're going to we're going to be building a lot more tall buildings. Um, the tall mm. buildings that we are going to build are going to become more complex. They're going to be built out mm. of modern materials. Um, they're going to be fire engineered, so they're going to have all kinds of very very complex systems inside. And and so this problem is not getting simpler; it's getting more complex. Do you think for change to happen, though, we all have to uh, agree on some universal truths? Like, we have to agree on a fact. It's a bit like you and me saying, well, I really do think that you need to learn to swim, Russ, because if you fall in the water, you'll drown. And you go, no, no, I won't, because the water's uh, not actually a threat, so I don't need to learn to swim. I know that seems like a facetious, stupid example, but unless both sides agree that they're is well and truly an issue with the way that we are building these buildings, the materials, the um, 
the escape plans, the fundamentals around staircases, and the, you know, I think the UK is one of only two or three, isn't it, that uh, only have only legislate one staircase. Yeah, that's, um, it's a. Uh... It's one that's. It's just like we like to think we're at the tip of the bloody sword in the Western world. But I can tell really you, not having, the case in certain things. having done it, I did a, a tour around Australia and, and uh, I spent a reasonable amount of time in the States. Um, in some quarters in the United States, we're a laughing stock. And that hurts. That, 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 that absolutely cuts to the bone when, when mm. people are saying, well, why didn't you? How did this happen? How did you allow this to happen? How did. Mm-hmm. How did seventy-two people die in a in a, in a modern city in London, um, to the extent that they did? Do they have more teeth in other countries? Do you think to to enact this change? Yeah, I, or do they just have a greater appetite? Or? I spent some. I was lucky enough to spend some time with the uh, fire service in São Paulo in Brazil, where in the seventies oh. there were there were a number of very high-profile, multi-fatality fires. And they have very stringent powers. They can enter any premise, including private residence, with with due cause. Um, they can arrest people. They can empty buildings and, and empty buildings. At, you know, if they think it's an unsafe building, they can just say, "Right, everybody out now," and and, and they can empty the building out. Um, and that's based on their experience. But you're looking at São Paulo. That's a city with what 32 million people in it. And when mm. I visited it and looked out the window, it's just a forest of tall buildings, um, mm. and they don't have. They and don't arguably have, on a lower socio-economic level. Yeah, they don't have mains gas. So on every balcony, no, that's what I'm saying. On every balcony yeah. of every high rise, there's two LPG cylinders. <laughs> Jesus. So, <laughs> so you, one of the benefits from travelling and talking to people is that you do come at this from different directions. Um, mm. Working, I did back in the last year, working in Ireland, actually, and, and in Dublin now, they're going to start building some tall buildings in the Docklands area. Um, and John Chubb, do you ever meet John? John is a good friend of mine. and uh, they We had John on the podcast about three years okay, ago. He's, We're going to have to have he's him on He's a great again. guy. And he was, he's, very knowledgeable bloke, absolutely love him. He's uh, very influential. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't operate, stay put, remain in place at all. They think it's bizarre. Uh, and it was really interesting. Similar in most places in Germany, now they don't operate it. Uh, they think it's okay. a um, it's a false concept. Um, so, so is it confirmed fire, just total evacuation, or, or well, phase? They or? say to the people in the building, if you want to evacuate, evacuate. If mm-hmm. you want to leave the building, then leave the building. And, and of course, one would assume and hope that the building is built in such a way that the escape routes are the integrity of those are not called into question. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, going back to the Bronx fire, why the, why the Bronx fire was so lethal? It was because, you know, one front door. Uh, part of that story is that one front door was left open, flooded the whole building with uh, mm. with toxic toxic gas. Um, so the integrity of you know barriers that we think should be there, if they're not there, then a lots of our assumptions just sort of fall apart. In other news, this episode is brought to you in partnership with MSA Safety. Today, we have them to thank for the improved firefighter safety through connectivity in their brand new connected firefighter system. At the center of the connected firefighter platform is the MSA M1 SCBA with telemetry. You can view battery life, air pressure, and estimated time remaining either independently on the M1 itself or from the lunar connected device screen. Also, still with the air status alarm information, search status, and all of this provided to the Incident Command for confident decision making during the scene. That integrates straight in with the lunar system, which is a wireless all in one device creating an independent search and rescue network, providing edge detection, enhanced personal thermal imaging, while simplifying post scene reporting and data retention. One of the key parts of the Luna is their FAST system, the Firefighting Assisting Search Technology. This combines directional and distance information with thermal imaging to help find separated teammates and decrease response time. It actually connects you to the other crews in the vicinity for a unified search during the time of mutual aid by instantly notifying the network of lunar devices when there is a downed crew member, allowing for a prompt search and rescue. All of this then plugs into the FireGrid system for cloud-based connectivity, real-time information, and data-driven decisions for the incident commander. It enables you to see the exact location of your firefighters on the scene. And it doesn't require you to be sat on the station. The MSA hub then provides a wireless gateway straight to the cloud, enabling wireless on-scene data for local and remote incident command for additional eyes on the scene. 
MSA are truly taking massive strides in the future of improved firefighter safety through connectivity. MSA is dedicated to increasing safety in the fire service through technological advancements. Various feature enhancements, new products, partnerships and integrations will provide additional capabilities readily accessible by products, software and services in the brand new MSA Connected Firefighter platform. Now back to the show. So we'll come back to the Bronx Fire. I'll stick a pin in that for now. I wanted to ask you because we mentioned about the IFE there. Um, I'm really intri- I've had a few conversations with the IFE, yet to have them on. We've, we've kind of flirted with the idea a few times and I think it's just been a diary aspect of not getting them on similar with the Fire Brigades Union and other unions in total honesty IFE was huge when I joined uh, it was part of all of your promotional exams um, many many wonderful things I think came from the IFE and there's still so much valuable learning there one of the things that relates to our conversation that concerned me the most is building construction and some of the physics around that and uh, and the aspects that were really well embedded within some of the IFE uh, modules, certificates, qualifications, diplomas and things like that. We seem to have thrown that out the window in a lot of services and brigades and don't seem to have replaced it with anything else. I mean, I don't know why you need to reinvent the wheel if something's not broken, don't fix it. But um, we like doing that sometimes. Uh, but I think to myself... That's not part of firefight development at all anymore. Yeah, and of course, I, I don't want to lapse into sort of, um, uh, you know, nostalgia is not what it used to be. Um, but mm-hmm. I do it was sort of hazy eyed remember the fire service college back in the day when you'd have, yeah. when I went there to do parts of my fire engineering degree, and you'd have, you'd have uh, firing, you know, inspecting officers doing the long course, what we used to refer to as the long course. And, You'd have these rooms full of nothing but fire doors and stuff that you'd wander around looking at them and getting to know you. Now, yeah. of course, there's always been this, you know, I'm a firefighter. I don't want to do fire safety because it's boring and I want to go out and do the do the so-called front end stuff. Um, but, of course, the two are, you know, there is, it's a symbiotic relationship that you, you, you need. Mm. You do need that, that, that grounding. And certainly I remember doing my... Uh, exams, uh, my, my IFE exams, and, and you had to sort of, and I had the, the old manuals of fire and sh- firemanship for those who remember those sort of series still of books, well, somewhere, and, and yeah, working your way through them, and some of the diagrams the service drill book. I've got them all on my side. Quite ancient <laughs> in there, but uh, it certainly made you sort of understand, I think, the fundamentals of that. So here we are in a modern fire service, we're looking at virtual reality, um, I think we have to try. It's a blended learning environment we need to have. Um, mm. I'm a huge supporter of the IFE. I'm a huge supporter of the Fire Service College, um, although, you mm. know, and both of them have gone through highs and lows in the, in my, during my career in the last 30 years. I will tip the hat to say that National Operational Guidance in the UK does have uh, a great deal of uh, useful content on there as well around building construction and stuff like that. I don't think it's all mandatory learning, but... Um, you have got uh, the IFE present at, uh, at this uh, this particular event that's, that's happening this year. Um, talk to me around your relationship with uh, you know Hayley Burgess. She's kicking it off. She's doing the, the official opening. Um, what does it mean without you know setting you up to blow smoke up IFE's ass? You know to, to have their support and to be bringing then because again people in the bubble of the UK won't know perhaps some of them certainly early on in their careers. IFE is uh, is a global organisation. Yeah, IFE is, you know, um, back in the day, it was predominantly a fire service organisation. Um, mm-hmm. Then, of course, back when we, we when we had the, the fire safety order uh, came out and lots of firefighters then went out and became fire risk assessors, we certainly, from when I was running the CPD programme in the South East, we'd have a lot of non-uniform people coming to our meetings because it was the only way they could get CPD. So and certainly now I would say that it's a broad church, um, although it still does have to some degree some o- overtones of, of being very fire service orientated. It certainly doesn't, it shouldn't be that way. Um, for me, it's been a big part of my career because uh, it was the way that I got on when I was in the fire service. Uh, I remember doing my LFs and sub-officers practical exams, again, for those who might remember those. Um, and then I took my grad IFE so that I got my qualified station officer. Um, um, so it was a big help to me. And, and um, as ha- 
having a structured format and challenging. You know, some of those members' papers exams are really hard. You know, it's not a it's not a gimme qualification. Pay your twenty five quid and you get your you get your certificate back. It's a, it's for anybody that's done the exams. They they are hard and they are they are they are meant to find out for those people who have got the ability, but also have got the you know will sit there and grind out the hours of doing some study with them. So I think it's it's mm. it's 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 served the industry well, and I think it's changing. So um, I've always wanted to get um, the IFE involved because one of the things we do with the conference is we award CPD hours. So for the conference that we've got coming up at FDIC, there's 18 hours of CPD. And for me as a chartered fire engineer, that goes a long way down the line of getting my, you know, getting my CPD hours in for the year, which is. Mm. I think it's vitally important that we stay current. You know, competency is not a is not an MOT. It's it's a, you have to keep becoming aware of new technology. One hundred percent. Just keep learning, really. Uh, and I think the the IFE is a good vehicle for that. It it runs on volunteers. It runs on people getting involved and contributing. Um, the people that are prepared to do that are are in a, a you know, I'm a great advocate of the was it uh, Oscar Wilde says the eighty twenty rule. You know. Twenty percent of people do; the other eighty percent criticise. So eighty twenty is the Pareto principle, yeah. But Oscar Wilde's always got a wonderful way of adapting stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so there are plenty of people out there who, who want to throw bricks and and, and criticise it, but you of course you've got to roll your sleeves up, get involved, join, become part of committees, and then and then and make it improve. You know, it, and it's got a huge legacy. We've just gone past the hundred year anniversary of it, and I'm delighted that Haley Burgess, that the the first. Uh, female uh, international president is coming to our conference to open it and uh, I'm trying really hard to make sure that we get gender equality on the program it's, it's not always easy mm-hmm. um, but mm-hmm. I'm pleased to say that we've got a number of uh, female fire colleagues um, uh, on the conference program and uh, they're eminent and they're, they're leaders uh, and that's great to see there's some incredible people on the books, absolutely. I wanted to uh, circle back, if we could, for the Bronx Fire. So I said we'd, we'd stick a pin in it, so I want to promise people will come back. So for people that aren't familiar, we will put a link into uh, the notes for this. A lot of this information is also available on your website, tallbuildingsfiresafety.com. There's a wonder of great uh, case studies on there, so we'll refer people into that. But this was the morning of January 9th. It was 2022. Uh, the High Rise Fire itself, well, they've got it written down as the High Rise Fire, killed 17 people, including eight children. Um, the Twin Parks Northwest Site 4 High Rise Apartment Building in the Bronx, New York. Um, another 44 people were injured, uh, 32 were life threatening injuries. But similar to aspects of, and a lot of this came up with Michael Reich's conversation, and again, the origin of, of things such as. Um, smoke curtains and uh, smoke hoods I know of which you're covering uh, in greater depth on the conference as well talk to me if you can about some of the the whistle stop tour learnings and that sounds very disrespectful but I want to say we know we're not going to we're not going to do it justice by trying to cover all of it here Um, the issues of the Bronx fire was effectively in my limited understanding there was multiple self-closing doors uh, that didn't close properly and again it was a 19-story building which effectively filled with smoke, and it was the smoke that killed the vast majority of residents. Yeah, I'm. You know, I, the audience on this on this podcast. You know, I, I, I don't want to um, be disrespectful because they probably know you know some of the, the technical aspects of this. But the for me, the interesting teachers to suck eggs because there's people at different levels oh, of right, okay. their development here. We don't want to go over the head and disengage some people. And for those people that already know it, they'll roll their eyes for a second, okay. but that's fine. So, you know, the biggest, the biggest cause of fire in high-rise buildings is electricity. It's, um, and we spend the least amount of time on trying to resolve issues with electrical equipment, portable electrical equipment, et cetera, et cetera, in buildings. And this fire was started by a portable electrical heater. Um, it was mm-hmm. in, obviously in the winter in New York. Um, and we think about Lacanoy House, which was a television set. So... You know, misuse of and and continued use of damaged, obsolete, you know, dangerous electrical equipment, whatever it might be, is you know is is the big is the big one. Which is when I when I'm teaching on my course, tall buildings fire safety management course, we say to people, what steps have you got to try and address the issue of electric, electrical fires? You know, 
we used to pat test, portable appliance test everything. We used to sheep dip everything. We don't do that anymore, and certainly mm-hmm. we don't do it in private dwellings. But I'm stunned. I think with the proliferation of things like Amazon and stuff as well, yeah. though, and you know eBay and things like that, we've just got so much around us as this race to the bottom of cost uh, allows in things that have not gone through that same uh, level of uh, sort of scrutiny. Yeah, and one of the things you know uh, that I that, that I am stunned at is how many electrical appliances are subject to a product recall that we will never know about. So, yeah. um, you know, when you go out and buy a toaster or a microwave and you unpack the box and you, you get all the paperwork with it and you chuck it in the bin, and you just plug it in and get on with it because you know, it's fairly intuitive, most of the stuff. Yeah. Well, that, that, that slip of paper, that warranty that says, you know, that's the only way, if you don't fill that in, that's the only way the manufacturer can tell you if that's subject to a product recall. So I'm going, I'm going down a rabbit hole with this, but... No, 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 please keep going. Okay, so, so it's really, really important that anybody that's tasked with, with fire safety management in a building has to understand that electricity is the biggest cause of fire. So the question I would say to people is, well, what are you doing about that? Because there's lots of people who want to talk about self closers on doors and extinguishers and mm. um, barbecues on balconies and all the, all the other things that we have to do. But the biggest cause of fire is electricity. And yet we, we, we look mm-hmm. at it. So one of the uh, one of the skills that I, I've learned is the use of thermography, not for firefighting now. This is thermographic surveys to detect uh, early indications of um, electrical component failure. Mm-hmm. Really, really. Uh, so degradation of cables yeah. and things. So like I've that. got a, I've got a thermal imaging camera now, um, and they retail at about two hundred and fifty pounds. Um, you can actually get a, a device now to uh, attach to your mobile phone that will turn your mobile phone into a thermal imaging camera. No, absolutely, way. yeah. And, and oh, so man, I'm gonna have to we, we use this in the construction industry for monitoring um, hot work uh, when it's in progress. Um, so I'm advocating now, and I and, and I certainly t- during my training, I advocate people now get yourself a thermal imaging camera, use it when you're going around looking at electrical equipment, and and see if stuff is overheating. Um, and certainly now the big buildings, the big towers in London, they're mandated by their insurers now to do a compulsory thermographic survey, uh, where they'll come around and look at your wiring systems, your connections, and stuff like that. Oh wow! I'm just having a look at them now. Oh, actually, some of them are quite expensive. <laughs> Fleur have got one. Teledyne have got another one. Um, wow, I want to buy one of them. They look wicked. Yeah, well, they could, as I say, you can get one that you can just you can attach to your to your mobile phone and you can turn it into a thermal. Yeah, that's the ones I'm looking at. The yeah, one I've got is USB C connection. It's about the same size as a mobile phone, and um, it was about two hundred and eighty quid. Um, and even in the hands of a one. non-technical person, you know, you can see when something comparatively is overheating. Uh, or when a connection is failing. Um, so I suppose the question for, I say to people who run tall buildings, etc., is what, what are you doing about electricity? Because uh, we get fixated on the usual stuff and there's nothing wrong with the usual stuff. And I'm talking about, you know, accumulation of rubbish or whatever else it might be. But, you know, the biggest cause of fire is electricity. So, you know, work out what you're going to do about it. And if it it could be say for say for blocks of flats, you know, going through and saying to people, look, can we just can you give us the make and models of all of your white goods in your kitchen, and we'll let you know they're subject to a product recall at the moment. Mm. I mean, that's such an easy thing to do. So, coming back to um, the Bronx, like so, so that, yeah, I went off the breakdown. Anyway. Sorry about that. No, 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 no! You didn't at all. I loved it. That's why. That's why we get down the rabbit holes. The rabbit holes are where many of the great nuggets lie. Um, these were there was a series of apartments in this ninety story building. Some were single story, some were dual story uh, apartments, and I think it caught a mattress straight after the heater caught fire to the mattress, didn't it? And spread to the next floor of the apartment, and then it was like a domino effect through the rest of the um, uh, the local spaces, the, the, the words escaping in my FP brain has gone to sleep. Um, yeah, the communal spaces of the building was then when it started falling down. Because this is, I know uh, on the conference itself, Frank Lieb uh, is going to go into a wonderful case study for this and they're going to cover so much yeah. so much great stuff. So I don't want to tread all over Frank's stuff. Frank's a good, but, Frank's um, a good mate of mine. He, he was OIC at the Bronx Fire and you're right, he's doing the opening on the Monday, the 15th of April. He's doing that keynote, isn't he? That is going to be a pin drop in the room moment. I think oh, just people will be on the edge of their seats. That'd be great. Yeah, and he's uh, he. this will be the second time he's spoken at our conference. 
over the years, and he's a, he's a great guy. Um, but then you've got you know the inevitable things with with, with Bronx. You've got you know um, uncontrolled uh, movement of smoke and toxic gases through the building, um, compromising means of escape. You've got around that building. If anybody looks at the website, you'll see that it's a heavily congested, uh, very difficult access. Uh, in fact, one of the TL turntable ladder pitches was 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 way across. The TL is almost horizontal to pitch to one of the windows. Um, so you've got those classic urban density environments where you're trying to do work, you're trying to get rescues and, and people. And of course, once the escape routes are compromised, um, then... Mate, I do look back at the investment we've put in TLs and many of the big 64 plus meter appliances that are around the world. I wonder what the firefighters in 15 years, 20 years will say when they see all the money we spent on these. And with the greatest of respect, they're fantastic vehicles, fantastic people that make them. It's, it's a wonderful tool, but I think people's perception of how that tool can be applied and deployed and in what circumstances it would actually be of any tremendous use um it's um it's a wide spectrum uh and i'm not slamming it we've we've, you know, we've probably got partners that make them but um and i think they're fantastic but they have the limitations like any tool does yeah i think I, I mean i can only speak from my career trying to you know get somebody off a second floor balcony onto the you know the head of a ladder um they're not an escape tool Ram that. There's just, can you imagine yeah, trying? Can you imagine floor. trying to extract a, a, an occupant off a, a seventh right floor? Ridiculous. People think, oh, it reaches a thirtieth floor. That's everyone rescued from floor zero to. No, absolutely not. Absolutely no. not. Not a chance. No, it, it's it's a useful tool to have in the box, but would is it? If you've got amazing compartmentation for an for an external attack, and again, when we have Brent Brooks on, we're talking about. You know the branch, the branch below, the curtains they can uh, deploy when a, a wind-driven fire breaks out. But if you've got great compartmentation in the uh, compartment itself, um, then you, it's a great tool to have for external firefighting, hundred percent, and it would be very effective. That in combination with, say, some of the branches that they're more adopted in the U.S. and other places of the world, a great firefighting media tool. But never, not never, but very rarely would that ever be effective for rescue. Yeah, and, and it's certainly that's what I teach. And, and, and the other thing as well, of course, uh, that, that I get building managers to think about is where you're going to operate this. So um, mm-hmm. recently um, saw Brent doing a bit of a world tour in, in Singapore where actually outside of the, some of the buildings in Singapore, they've actually got demarcated areas where they can they can park height vehicles. Oh. Now... That's great. Now, when I run my courses, I generally do it in London, and occasionally we do get access to a, a height vehicle from London. And what I say to the building managers is, this this vehicle weighs, you know, anything from sort of twenty two to thirty tons. You know, do you know where your soft patches are outside? Do you know that the, the is the hydrant system going to give you enough water? Um, yeah. Because these are beasts, and know. with everybody digging underground in London as well, these, I just I can just see one of these things. These are beasts. These these the these, these uh, vehicles are beasts, and unless you can feed them with water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, listen, I'm, you know, are they have they got functionality? Yes. Are they practical? Uh, well, the time will tell, as far as that's concerned. I don't know how many streets in London are wide enough for one of those to deploy completely at I full height in anything like a you know, I'm not going to share them completely but it's not good yeah, anyway I, mean, I don't um, want to I don't want to dis- I think they can only fit think, it in three fire stations as well is there is there is there smarter ways to spend that money well that's the that's the debate yeah I know we had a chat with a guy and the conversation the conversation hasn't come out yet who did the um the acquisition procurement for them and the answer was more of a uh, to pacify the public uh they gave them several options and uh they said get the biggest one that's available in the world so i think they went out to it might have been australia no it wasn't where was it It might have been tokyo or somewhere or dubai i can't remember they went out to where there was a 61 in place and then basically bought one and that was it um but yeah and again we're going down a rabbit hole but a worthwhile rabbit hole and again much more of that will be discussed i'm sure when we're at the um when we're at the uh, conference itself take me on to so uh, as though by design (laughs) straight after that we've got susan johnson um and i know day three is uh, michael reich as well 
So we've got the use of smokers in high-rise residential buildings, a big conversation that came out of uh, Grenfell and many other uh, incidents around the world with regard to, let's assume we don't manage to secure the most important compartment in a high-rise building, i.e. the staircase, what's the solution then? And the deployment of staircase protection teams, which has uh, been adopted in some places in the UK, not uh, widespread completely. Could you give us some insight into some of the tactics that you've seen in your travels around deploying people above the bridgeheads, use of smoke hoods, um, staircase protection methods, uh, and again, just some of the low-hanging fruit that you've seen as good practice? Yeah, well, let's start off with the smoke hoods. Um, before before COVID, I was, doing, I was traveling a lot with work, and I did several jobs in China, not just the Shanghai and Beijing, but other places, uh, more remote areas. And I need to get on your bloody diary. Jesus, man. Um, you go some good adventures. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we'd stay in reasonable hotels, sort of four, three, four-star hotels-ish. That's what the budget would, would reach. Um, and getting into the hotel room after a long journey, you know, straight to the mini bar, no, straight to the closet to hang my clothes up and open the closet and, and what's inside the closet in every hotel I stayed in two smoke hoods and a torch. Oh, wow. In every hotel in China. So smoke hoods are commonplace in many parts of the world, including Japan and the use of smoke hoods. Now, of course, they are only filtration systems. Um, Mm -hmm. But what my colleagues in the fire service are telling me at the moment now, because smoke hoods have been deployed now around the country, is that they're Mm -hmm. using them regularly. Um, The occupants seem to respond well when you knock on the door. I mean, can you imagine knocking on the door in BA, breathing on BA, and Mrs. Miggins, 88, answers the door, and you're standing there like Darth Vader saying, follow me down the stairs. It's You'll be fine. Why are you wearing all that stuff then? Oh, you'll be fine. Um, (laughs) So I think we're moving to a position where... If the major manufacturers can get the cost unit price down to about the equivalent of a good quality cycle helmet, I think you're going to see a lot of people in high rise buying smoke hoods. Mm. Do you think we'll get so this the the residences that you went to the the hotels and whatnot in China? Do you think that's just fantastic practice? Do you think that was legislated to them? Do you think it's uh, part of their uh, building fire risk assessment um, well of course because you know, it's kind of who's going to pick up that cost because like you say in a lot of services in the uk uh you'll get two on a truck maybe four um one for each ba set is usually the approach sometimes less and that's your lot usually and again more appliances more of the same but uh i don't think there's, there'll be enough well um, I think it's, it's it's paradoxical in as much as some of the hotels, some of the fire safety in the hotels was highly questionable. Um, and then, of course, you open the you open the you know the, the cupboard door, and there's two smoke hoods and a, and a torch. Um, I think when, like in China, you can get the unit price down to so low that it's it's not that much of a, a grudge purchase. Yeah. Um, and I think, despite you know. Several of my eminent colleagues who get very uh, angry with me for talking about this, in as much as uh, this is just paranoia, it's it, it, in the end it's only a filtration system. There was another system that's been trialled in Dubai where it looks a bit like a life vest and it has a small, um, I think it's a seven-minute cylinder in it, and you, you put you put the mouthpiece in, which is like a uh, you know a snorkeling mouthpiece, and you got five or six minutes. I do get the uh, I do get the particulate argument because again, when we look at uh, respiratory protection for our firefighters and a lot of the decontamination and stuff, I've had a few com- few conversations with toxicologists and they talk a lot about size of particulates and the substances that are burnt in these instances and how useful some PPE is and definitely is not and we're sometimes wearing a lot of that already that is realistically a bit of a chocolate fire guard when we when we think we're protecting ourselves from something, but that's more of a decontamination conversation. But uh, yes, the particulates will only be effective down to uh, down to a point with like the smoke hoods as an example. Yeah, but I, again, talking to colleagues, some of which were at Grenfell Tower, said you know they were leading people down the stairs. Their eyes were streaming; they could hardly see because mm-hmm. of the you know the the, uh, 
the um, the effect mm. of the particulates in there, let alone the breathing issue, but they just simply couldn't see. So, I think there's a, there's a, there's a debate to be had about smoke hoods, and and I would say to, I would say that if if you can get the unit price down and the quality at the right uh, level, and they're reasonably priced, I would buy one. I would mm. buy one, and I would take so, one if I was. I'm travelling on business, and I've um, and I've and I have stayed in some very fairly dodgy hotels. I, I would, I would, I would definitely, and I always take a torch with me wherever I go. Oh that yeah, sounds a bit like an anorak, but I've always got head a torch, torch next to the bed. I take a head torch not, not just my mobile phone. I'm talking about a proper torch, uh, just because yeah. if you need to get out or whatever. If you want to flash my window or something like that, and I know it sounds a bit naff, but. Um, if there was a smoker I could oh, put in my prepper. case and take with me, I would. I have it. a large bag that I take everywhere. It's got all sorts of stuff like that in copies of my passport and all this sort of jazz. I don't know what I think I am. Today's podcast is powered by our partner Lifelines and their revolutionary approach to functional hydration. Just like in firefighting, water is essential for body function, but studies show more than 80% of firefighters are dehydrated. A 25-year study findings from the National Institute of Health showed poor hydration to be linked to early aging and chronic disease and even mild dehydration results in significant negative impact outcomes including headaches, exhaustion, rapid pulse, irritability and poor cognitive function. A study conducted by Yale University showed that participants who were just 1% dehydrated had a 12% increase in errors when performing tasks that required cognitive flexibility. In addition, dehydration is shown to worsen mood and attitude, contribute to confusion and poor decision making and negatively affect memory and judgment. In other words, you really don't want your incident commander, firefighter or for that matter any first responder on a critical scene to be even slightly dehydrated. Mild dehydration occurs when a person is just 1.5% dehydrated, a condition that does not even trigger the third response in most people so just imagine how quickly a firefighter or any first responder can and does become dehydrated in their day-to-day duties which is why i address my hydration first thing every day with lifelines go into the notes for this episode and specifically check out lifelines hydro fuel and hydro og by clicking in the notes for the podcast for a clean energy solution designed for those who demand more from their day now back to the show so we spoke about uh, smoke hoods, a little bit of the public's uh, side of things there. Talk to me about tactics and deploying above the bridgehead without breathing apparatus, because this is a conversation that's happening across a lot of services. Uh, obviously, the examples we give there, some people will say the extreme examples, well, that's when that's when all the, all the proverbial poo has hit the fan, Russ. What about before that, when we've got a confined, confirmed fire on the 5th, 6th, 7th? You know, sending search teams above um, without BA because we have got some bleed into the staircase. Perhaps the staircase is not a pressurized staircase. Uh, we've activated some vertical vents, but we want to start assisting in evacuation. Um, one of the challenges, uh, Grenfell is an example, but I know Grenfell is an extreme case. But wanting to evacuate those further floors, um, there was uh, something obviously that came out from the FBU pushing back around deploying staircase teams. Yep. Um, and again, the terminology may differ from place to place, but I think people effectively know what we're talking about here. Um, talk to me about how risk averse we are or are not. That sounds like a biased question, and uh, what you're seeing in other places of the world. So one of the things, one of the highlights in my fire service career was I did a short trip over to New York and stayed in the engine house in Harlem, and, and went wow. on a couple of uh, went on a couple of fire calls with those guys, and it was a revelation to. You me. ever met Mickey Farrell? Sorry. Have you ever met Mickey Farrell? No, I can't. That name doesn't ring a bell with me. He's uh, he runs a uh, top floor tactics. He'd be a wonderful person to introduce you to. We had him on the podcast recently. Twenty six years FDNY, third generation firefighter, and he teaches a lot of high rise tactics there. But sorry, I interrupted you. That's can. all right, and I was I was fascinated by. Because you know, I've been absolutely drummed into me when I was doing my basic training about um, BA procedures, um, you know, stage one, stage two, and all that stuff. And it was kind of, you know, absolutely, you will not transgress this. Uh, it is mm-hmm. the holy grail of of, of bringing because yeah, yeah. you know, Gill Industry and all of those tragic incidents yep. in the past, which had, which had given us that. Um, what I've come to realise having spent some time, as I have around the world, talking to people, is that we're in a much different place now. If you look at the kit now that we're deploying, the monitoring systems that are now on a BA board, mm. um, I think we're yeah. I think we're in a different place. Uh, and, I, and I honestly believe that sending people into the search zone above the fire floor 
um, on air is going to render them their, their their effectiveness is going to be so short. It's an over index. It's an arbitrary requirement, and that sounds facetious and perhaps a little bit offensive even to some people. But remember what it is. Your BA is a is a form of PPE. Now. I don't expect you to wear your helmet all the time. I expect you to wear a helmet when you're in an area where something might fall on your head. Yeah, when you're in yeah. the hot zone, when you're outside the building, when you're whatever, standing at the bottom of a ladder. Yeah, you don't have to wear it all the time. I'm going to trust you as a competent firefighter that's trained in this kit to wear it when you see fit. Like you said, gas monitors, gas detection, smoke curtains, smoke hoods, um, longer duration BA sets, and also telemetry. You know, you'll know when I start using it because the number will start going down. Yeah. So I'll just wear it now, go through the board and commit to the stairwell to wherever I see fit. You I, know, I, I just, I I just think the on, technology's changed. I, I, in the recent years, uh, I, along with some other colleagues, have trained the Malta Fire Service in high rise uh, firefighting operations, which culminated in a, in, a, in a couple of large scale exercises. And they've got some great kit mm-hmm. now that they put straight into the stairwell on a number of floors, which is atmosphere monitoring, fixed atmosphere monitoring. Um, oh, so I, I think the state of the art has moved on. Um, and I honestly believe now that, re- that, that, that sort of rigorously enforcing the donning and startup at the bridgehead to go into the search zone is so task limiting. Um, mm-hmm. Um, and what do you do? Because you're setting people up to fail as well. You are, especially if you like, are. Say, and again, this, it's this question about you've got smoke spread. Fresh, you know, relatively speaking, fresh air. You're knocking on the door, and you've got an occupant in there. You're asking to leave, and you're donned in mm-hmm. BA. You can't talk to them. You can't make proper eye contact with them. I, I just think that it's. Uh, I, I know why the FBU are taking the position they are, and they're doing what they think is the right thing. I think. They, it's the, the question has to be asked now: Is does the new technology make a difference? Is it reliable? Is it consistent? And should we mm-hmm. should we use it? And, and if if the answer to that is yes, then I think the time is right for, in these circumstances, self management is is a viable option. I absolutely agree with you, mate. Because like you say, whatever fire on the eighth floor, if it does spread, it's an issue on the 29th and the thirtieth, and you're going to have to walk eighteen stories of clean air before you can get to the place you're trying to help people. Um, so I want to be uh, I want to be respectful of time because I know we've got so much we want to go to, but we're on, unfortunately, on our time cap um, this evening. You've got Peter coming on, Peter McBride as well. He's uh, You've got him day two. Love Peter. We have Peter on. Such a knowledgeable bride. I mean, you really do have a fantastic buffet. Of, we've got, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think, things. certainly in the North American arena, we've got the A-team. Um, very much so. Um, very much so. To, There's a few on so, there. I'm very jealous. Now, for of. your listeners that are firefighters, and they're probably thinking to themselves, "Hang on a minute, it's in America." You know, that's we're offering a 75 percent discount to serving firefighters to attend on the delegate mm. rate. So, you know, you have mm. to you have to shake the money tree to get your get your backside over there. But if you haven't been to FDIC before, um, I would say to you that it's a once in a career bucket list thing there's 40,000 firefighters in Indianapolis during the course of that week it, if you haven't been to it it's just extraordinary um, and, and I would yeah. commend it I, and obviously I've got a vested interest but I would commend it to you just as a thing to go to a go to a city where there's 40,000 firefighters streets blocked off you know bagpipe bands bars everywhere um, oh, that's not the reason for going, clearly. But you know, it's not a bad, it's not a bad adult. <laughs> that's where all the great networking happens, as well. You know, and that's yeah. where we we create these lifelong friends. And I, I'm finding it out more and more myself attending a series of events and and the FDIC and and the conference has been on my bucket list for two years now. And, and um, the, seri- the, the serious point, me. Pete, to be frank, is you know one of the criticisms that was levelled at London Fire Brigade is was a sense of sort of insular parochialism, you know. And we have to, we have to, I think for our, for our, you know, the people we serve and, and um, would expect us to have an open mind and go and have an active curiosity. Mm-hmm. Um, I do this on a micro scale. So I say people to exactly the same, but even within that, I just slightly expanded my, sphere of bias because i travel around the uk assessing at different fire and rescue services and i get to meet all the training departments and again there's there's 
there's a wide enough spectrum of variation of, of equipment and tactics, just even within the UK. But the more and more, I think I'd say the vast majority of the last 10 or 15 episodes for us have been international guests because I'm just getting an absolute relentless desire to keep speaking to some of the, and it almost fills me both with a dual sense of guilt and almost a bit of shame, but that's that's probably very harsh. I'm yeah, incredibly go, proud it, it, of the I, services that I work with, but I do think, oh God, it makes me it makes me question how good I thought we were. Well, and I don't and think, I think we're bad. I think we're doing I a great, a a great service I, to I think that's a good public, thing. I mean, but, again, for your for your listeners, if you go onto our website, www.tourbuildingfiresafety.com, you'll find the archive there. And the archive now has got Oh. All of the presentations, from, and it's free. There's no, there's no catches. There's nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to put the link in it, mate. It's so much in go there. Go and have a look at uh, to Steve Lackin. His, 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 his presentation. Go and have a look at um, Hong Kong. I think it was in uh, 2000, maybe in 2017. We had a delegation from Hong Kong Fire Service come to London, and they have a they, they have a team that just does high rise firefighting. They don't do anything else. That's it. They're a bit like Toronto. They don't do anything else but high-rise firefighting. So they don't do subsurface. They don't do RTAs, RTCs, whatever, hazmat. They don't do any of that. They just do high-rise firefighting. And they're like ninjas. Mm. Um, uh, and they, <laughs> they did a really great... I saw the uh, the presentation they had on considerations for elevator evacuations. I think it was Cone. Um, that was really good. That was back in the 2017 conference. There's so there's so much, uh, and and I keep finding things like this when I come across websites like yours, an absolute library of knowledge. You've got 2016 all the way through to 2023, full of archived uh, videos, downloads, PDFs. You know, this is this is like a this should be on bloody nog. This should be in an IFE module. You know, there's so much in there's there. A, there's a lot of stuff on there, and of course now we've got the uh, the YouTube channel. So we're now yeah. videoing all of the conference speakers. In fact, on the last conference, we had Professor Paul Christensen talking about EVs, lithium-ion batteries, and yeah. nobody really looked at it. We posted it in about November. Nobody really looked at it for about six weeks. And then somebody must have, some influencer must have picked it up in January, and it's now at 84,000 views. We had him on um, <laughs> just about uh, towards the back end of last year. An absolutely fantastic conversation. Yeah. One of our one of our probably most popular episodes at the time, but it's self perpetuating. Everything seems to keep growing. That's what's great about YouTube and also about podcasts is that people discover it. So that again, from from having a conversation with you today, people from your network will probably discover this podcast, and you end up rediscovering, as I have with your website, all of the great people that you're already familiar with, and you hear a different variation, different version, something else comes up, and you just add it as another layer of paint. To the growing mountain of, of sort of knowledge that you're that is there available there's never been so many resources available to people but i think our resourcefulness has diminished a little bit do you know what i mean and it sort of alludes to what you said around people getting stuck in well interesting their looking, own at, echo chambers. looking at the analytics in the early days of the youtube channel the the dwell time was about two minutes and what we're mm. finding now with the subscribers is the dwell time is about 25 minutes so of course, we're used to flicking, aren't we? Swiping and, and doom scrolling. Um, yeah. What it actually needs is, is you do need to give this some concerted effort. But just, you know, on, on just to finish off on on FDIC, we've gone for yes. a, a magazine format this year. So we're hopping around subject matter, whereas in the past we used to theme it on certain things. So there'd be two or three speakers talking about similar stuff. I've deliberately gone for a magazine format because we want a mixed audience of firefighters, fire engineers, architects, insurers, building managers, um, equipment suppliers, etc., sitting in the same room having a having a sort of cross-fertilization discussion. So one minute we're going to be talking about smoke hoods, the next minute we're going to be talking about facade testing, the next minute we're going to be talking about green walls, we're going to be talking about other things. So uh, it's a very eclectic program. Uh, it is biased towards mm -hmm. firefighting because we are at FDIC. But um, anyway, enough of an advert. No, 100%, brother. I think it's going to be absolutely incredible. So we'll put this link in there as well, but it's at Tall BLDG Fire Safety on YouTube. And again, if people just look underneath this episode, uh, you'll get the links. We're going to chuck a whole lot in there. So the International Tall Buildings Conference, uh, FDIC International, will be a link to the website there. Uh, we'll put a link to tourbuildingfiresafety.com 
Uh, I was going to put your LinkedIn link in there if that's appropriate, Russ, if people want to reach out to you personally, if that's appropriate. Yeah, I'm, I'm always interested in, um, in people challenging me. I, I, I'm, 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 I've got a distinct view on the two staircase issue. Uh, I've, I've been in the, 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 the fire press recently giving my view. We've had several eminent people come out now and, and, um, and say that the two staircase requirement is an overreaction. Um, I'm very really? clear now that um, unless we accept... Do they belong to construction companies by any chance? No, actually, there's some pretty senior, pretty serious, and, and people I respect, fire engineers, who are saying that uh, uh, it's it's a, it's a simplistic answer. I, I commend anybody, have a look at the article that I wrote recently um, about some of the issues why I'm thinking that th- there has to be some designed contingency. I used the words redundancy, and, and that got up a lot of people's noses when I said that. But um, one of the telling... When I went to FDIC, I was attending and I sat in a, a lecture on a high-rise from a guy from Las Vegas, fire chief from Las Vegas, and he said something that really shocked me. He said, when we go out to fight fires in buildings, we expect 100% failure of the building systems. That's, that's, our, that's our planning assumption. 100% of the Jesus. building systems will not work through firefighting elevators and lifts, standpipes, smoke control, compartmentation they expect a hundred percent but it's stuck in my memory because then i came back and i when i wrote the paper i was saying you know how many, and, and i try i went to several uh, social housing providers and i said can you tell me the, the current availability of your lifts in your high-rise buildings social housing and they all go very coy and very quiet they don't really want to talk about how often their lifts are not working certainly the firefighting lifts are not yeah. working uh, and that that data, you know, that's a good freedom of information request that we could get get going because, you know, these these if we've got one staircase, which I believe is wrong, and then we add in all of these aggravating factors, you know, Grenfell Tower, the firefighting lift didn't work, the mechanism was choked with brick debris. You know, yeah. when we add in these aggravating factors, you know, you're just getting the odds stacked against you doing a decent job, and yet the mm-hmm. system will say. Well, it's co-compliant. You know, it's, it's it's fitted with all these these bells and whistles, um, so it, everything's okay. The lived experience is that it's not okay. You know, fire doors, cell closes are being you know taken off. Um, systems are not being maintained, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, I'm, I'm, get, I'm I can feel me climbing up on my soapbox. Um, <laughs> Brother, combi- I'd love to champion you further on that. <laughs> combine that with things like cramming, massive over occupancy of buildings. Recent yeah. case, uh, a fire in a building uh, where we've got sort of 9, 10, 11, 12 people in a room in bunk beds in a, in a two-bedroom flat. Uh, that's not just a UK phenomenon, by the way. That's happening around the world. Over-occupancy or cramming, as I call it, uh, is, yeah. it's is a form really... It's abuse, I think. There's socio-economic abuse, It's willful it? blindness again. It's willful yeah. blindness again. Um, and... Uh, nobody really wants to talk about it. Because they don't matter. Many of these people, you know, English won't be their first spoken language, very yeah. very low down on the socioeconomic bandwidth. They can't, they don't know their rights. Um, they're just struggling to, you know, you say pull up your bootstraps. Some of these people ain't got bootstraps. You know, some of these people are just struggling to get by day to day. And, uh, you know, they're easily abused by people in, in, in other positions of authority. Um, and the other thing I, I mentioned in the paper was, was was the subject of hoarding. You know, it's one thing to have a hoarder mm. in a bungalow uh, who, who wants to fill their house with, you know, massively excessive mm. amounts of stuff. If you've got a hoarder on the first floor of an 18-storey building, then that's a that is a massive issue. If you've got somebody that's going to compromise the rest of the I think we're yet to see the full manifestation of that iceberg, you know, because I think from my travels out and about on fire engines just in the the locality that I live and work, it's gotten significantly worse post-COVID. A lot of people have not come back out and reintegrated in society and we have created a significant more hoarders, is my personal belief. And it's never been so easy now to completely live off-grid if you wanted to. Order all your shopping, order everything from Amazon. You don't have to leave your home if you don't want to. And I think there's a lot of reclusive people which we're completely unaware of. And I think that's a bit of a ticking time bomb as well. Yeah, and a lot of tall buildings now, we've got a right, we've done away with refuge chutes because, you know, and you know the stock in trade for firefighters is a refuge chute fire. 
Um, but now yeah. it means they have to carry the stuff down. Um, now, there's, there's, there's pros and cons with that, but you get my point. I, I suppose what I'm saying is, yeah. is that um, the status quo was rocked by Grenfell. Um, we are living in times, political times, where money is tight. You know, people talk about the cost of living and budgets are tight, etc. I think you're now beginning to pe- get people say, well, you know, the statistics still look all right. Was it an anomaly? Was it a one-off? I don't think that's right personally, uh, but but you know you can understand why politicians are probably saying now we've limited resources. Where do we spend our money? And, um, um, and I think we need to stop trying to punch above our weight, you know, without getting into a government conversation. But just look after our own residents, look after the people of the UK a bit more. We we send so much money to other places trying to act like a big global superpower, and I, and I, I I'm I'm a knuckle dragging moron, so what do I know? But I just do see the uh, I, I see citizens that really struggle, and uh, you know from from our conversations and conversations in the sector, you read all the fire investigation documents. You, it just feels like we could be looking after people a little bit better. But anyway, I don't want us to finish on a somber note, um, mate. I think the work you do is incredible. I think you have put together an absolute team of Avengers. Um, for this next conference. I think it's going to be absolutely incredible. And I thank you for the work that you do. I thank you for the work you do with the IFE and for the volunteers that are involved in that. We're going to put all those links in the notes to this. So if people click underneath here, still plenty of time to get out there. I'm still working diligently to get leave and support and shave the money tree uh, to try and get my ass out there as well. Um, Hoping my wife doesn't leave me. I do need to be at home every now and again. She has these funny requests that I stay at home every now and again. I don't know why she does that. But anyway, <laughs> I thank you so much for it, brother. Thank you so much for your time tonight as well. I'd love to have a conversation again in about six months' time. Maybe we'll see each other out there as well. Yeah, you'd be very welcome. And, and uh, if you do make it out to FDIC, I'll, uh, I'll buy the first beer. How's that? Beautiful. It's a deal. See you soon, brother. Thanks. The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, talent, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders and please head over to our patreon page and for just three pound a month you can support the future of the podcast please finally hit that follow subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening and wherever you're in the world please support your emergency services responders and thank you for listening